That one we were just. I was just thinking. So no, no, it's your it's your homework. What was the homework last week? How old was Fatima when she? Yes, mm -hmm. I want to know. I heard it was six. Wallah, from who? From uh, Islamic sources. Some? From like some Islamic sources. Like, Mashallah. Yeah, that that makes sense. That makes sense. She was six. I like that. What was what, what, what? Tell us the story, the context about her being six. Uh, well, Rasulullah Sallallahu in Mecca, he uh, he used to get rejected yeah. by the by the bad people. So one time, if I don't if I don't remember, one of those uh, one of the mushrikeen. Yes. The, he brought the uh, the gut of the, the guts of the camel and yeah. threw it on Rasul when he was making sujood, and Fatima came in and took off. So okay, so that's the story. Uh, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the Kaaba, he was doing sujood and uh, <coughs> one of the mustahzi'een dropped the gut of the, uh, the camel uh, on him and he remained there until uh, Fatima radiallahu anha came. Ibn Mas who was Ibn Mas'ud or Ibn Abbas was there? Uh, Ibn Abbas was there but he couldn't do anything. Is it Abbas or Ibn Mas'ud? Uh, Ibn Abbas. Okay. No, no, no. Ibn Abbas, that was later. Ibn Mas'ud was earlier. So Ibn Mas'ud, he was also very young. And he couldn't do anything. Maybe it's in the Abbas. He can do anything <laughs> until... Ahlan wa sahlan. Until... Fatima, who was six years old, she came fearless. And she removed that from uh, the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so... Um, all of this happened. All of this istihza wal iza you know, hurting the Prophet Sallallahu and injuring him and this um, activities went on for a few years from the first year until really when they left Mecca, they made Hijrah and um, we also spoke about the Islam of Hamza and Hamza was, uh, became Muslim when? Uh, in the sixth year. Sixth year. And Sayyidina Umar? I think it was a few days after. A few days after, three days after. So Sayyidina Hamza became a Muslim. Sayyidina Umar, three days later, became a Muslim. So the Islam of Hamza we spoke about last week was very interesting. How, uh, you know, he came back from hunting and he had the bow. And uh, the maid of uh, one of the people living around there uh, witnessed how they were mistreating the Prophet Sallallahu So when he entered, and, he, and she told, did you know how they were treating your, your nephew, Ibn Akhi? And he, she, when she, she explained it to him, he went right back to the Kaaba and he took his bow and he hit Abu Jahl on his face very uh, violently. And, and, and the, um, they tried to stop him and said, no, no, don't. I, really, I was really uh, injuring the Prophet. I was really injuring Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and, and he, he says, uh, do you do this to a man that I believe? How could you insult him? And I am following his religion. And this was like we said last week, it was Islam Hamiya. At first it was uh, very emotional and, and from out of compassion to, to his nephew. And, but this disturbed him a little bit, so he, he didn't sleep that night. He went to the Kaaba, he made tadarru'. And then he went and he told this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him, he made dua for him and his Islam became very, very firm until he became known as Al-Asad, the lion, Hamza Al-Asad, radiallahu anhum wa ardahum. So this, this uh, idha was happening all around for many years to all of his companions. And they were suffering, but for them the suffering the suffering was sweet for them. It wasn't a problem. They were, it was easy for them to, to be patient until they became the A'imma. Because they had to go through this and the Prophet ﷺ wanted them to be firm. This was going to happen. It's the sunnah of life. If you say the truth and you believe in Allah, that it will become, uh, that one has to be tested. As soon as you say the truth, you have to be ready to be patient. 
And as uh, Allah has said about um, Yusuf alayhi salam, وكذلك مكننا يوسف at the end of his life going through all those hardships at the end he became firm he became the king he became the, the one who was uncontested and Allah says about these مستضعفين ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الورثين so Allah wanted to favor them they went through that but he wanted to favor them and raise them until they became this mustad'ifin until they became uh, the imams they became very firm and they became the inheritors of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if there are any prophets after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be the, compan the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we've seen how bilal suffered uh, remember how bilal went through uh, what was the name of his uh, master oh, umay ibn khalaf umay ibn khalaf uh, used to mistreat him very harshly and uh, he would be very firm and he would say what? Ahadun. Ahadun, ahad. And this is a proof that you can say the name of Allah, Mufradan. You can say Allah, and this is dhikr. It's acceptable. Allah, Allah. Sidna Bilal said, Ahadun, Ahad, Ahad, Ahad. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not say anything. So this was ex perfectly acceptable. If you say, for instance, uh, and I'll give you the proof in, in the, the sunnah. Allahu, Allahu, Rabbi, la ushriku bihi shay'a. Uh, in the book of Imam Sayyuti, he says that this is one of the Asma'ullah, al udma And also one of the uh, Dua al-Mustajab. If you want anything to be answered, you say, Allah, Allah, Rabbi, la ushriku bihi shay'a. And ask whatever you want. If you're stuck in a problem, in, in you're being bullied, any, any problem. Allahu, Allahu, Rabbi, la ushriku bihi shay'a. So Imam, uh, so our our the great companion Bilal radiallahu anhu um, was being treated this way, and, and Abu Bakr passed by him, and he saved him, he freed him, because he was the responsible. Uh, he he was he did not do that just because he was responsible. He he really felt for for Bilal, and how much did he spend on him? What did he pay? Forty ounces of gold. Seventy buckets of silver. Wow. Seventy buckets of of silver. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu freed him because Umayyah ibn Khalaf said, if you only free him, he says, how long are you going to be making him suffer? He says, you're responsible by him. And he kept increasing his wage until he bought uh, Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu. And we spoke about uh, others. Uh, we don't speak too much about the mother of Bilal, Humama. She was also uh, uh, suffering and going through Amir ibn Fahira. Uh, Zinira, we spoke about her the last thing we spoke about her last week was Zinira, also Al Hindiya and her daughter Umm Ubais, and many women come in, and many women and many men Mustadafin who were not known, and Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu freed them. Ahlan wa sahlan. Marhaban. Salaamu alaykum. Ahlan wa sahlan. Ila Majlis al Ashraf, because we are in Majlis al Ashraf. So when Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he freed all these, we were told that he freed 57. No, 57 became Muslims by, in his hands. We don't know how many he freed, how many of these slaves he freed. Uh, Imam um, Al-Manawi, he, he has a sharh on um, Al-Fiyat al-Iraqi, who passed away in about 806. Al-Iraqi is a great muhaddith, but he also wrote an al fiya on the sun, on, on the, on the seerah, he called it Al-Fiyatu Saniyatu Nabawiyyatu And uh, Al-Imam Al-Manawi has a sharh In this he says that 57 uh, He became Muslim in his, under, his, under his hand Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Including the great Mubashirin al-Jannah uh, Of them is Uthman ibn Affan, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf Zubair ibn Awam, Talha ibn Ubaid uh, ibn Allah uh, Ibn al-Jarrah, uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd did I say someone wrong? So uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu freed all of these that, that I've mentioned. So they were all going through these uh, difficult times. We remember Ammar? Ibn Yasir. Ibn Yasir, his mother? Buntu? Khayyat. Ibn Khayyat, alayh. So these were, they passed away and he decided to? He said to her. He said something which was not in his heart. Yeah. To just get rid of To get rid of the torture. What did the Prophet say about him? Bad, bad? No, he said something. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not even just say it's okay, he says, Ammarun mulia imanan min farakihi ila qadabihi. He is full of iman. He said something to protect himself, and it's acceptable, as Allah says, illa man ukriha kuriha wa qalbuhu mutma'inul bil iman. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw, saw Ammar, he would say, Ammarun mulia iman min farakihi ila qadabihi. He's filled with iman. Don't you think anything about him. Radiallahu anhum jami'an. Khabbab ibn al-Art. We spoke about him, the, uh, the man who was uh, the, the Iron Man. And, yeah, and his, his mother was uh, torturing him. Not his mother, his master, the woman. Oh, the woman was in uh, Anmar, Anmar, you're right. Anmar, is that what you said? Uh, you said his mother or is that Anmar? I think it's uh, her, her name is Anmar. Hmm. Anmar tortured him and at the end she, was, she fell ill and the doctor told her you have to be uh, cured with that kite. Hmm. So he's the one who put the iron in the fire and put it on her skin, subhanAllah. So uh, Khabab al art is the person uh, who went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa kana rasulullah wa sallam fi dhill al-ka'bati mutawassidun ala burdatin Interesting, the word burda it's something which he puts on himself and he was sitting on it and leaning against the, the Kaaba, either lying down or leaning because in the hadith says فَجَلَسَ وَوَجْهُهُ مُحْمَرٌ so uh, Khabbab ibn Ar came to, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told him, Ya Rasulullah, ala tad'u lana, ala tastansir lana, please help us. We're going through so much trouble, so much hardship. And he said, stood up. And he sat on his burda. And he says, Ya Khabbab, listen. Innahu kana man qablikum. Before you, there were worse situations. Okay, there were, and, and I will not tell you the details of the hadith. It's a, People used to come and uh, the prophets and the companions of the prophets were put in a hole and they would cut them right in the middle. The person would be alive and they would be cut right in the middle. And what he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, They would torture these people before you and they would not be shaken. Their iman would become stronger. They would become more firm. And then he said a prophecy, a beautiful prophecy. And this was very interesting because here's the companions are being tortured and they're dying and they're being uh, tortured. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not just because he was confident and he was powerful in his, in his personality, but because it is wahi. لا ينطق عن الهوى فإنه هو وحي يوحى he doesn't speak from his own desires. It is revelation. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he says something, it's from Allah. And he says, إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُ الْقُرْآنَ وَمِثْلَهُ مَعَهُ I was given the Qur'an, and you see this? It's the same thing as the Qur'an. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his actions and his words, his behavior, it's like Qur'an. We take it divinely. Whatever he says, it's divine. And he says, وَلَيُظْهِرَنَّ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى هَذَا الْأَمْرَ حَتَّى يَسِيرَ الرَّكِبُ مِنْ صَنْعَاءِ إِلَى حَذْرَ مَوْتِ لَا يَخَافُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَالذِّئْبَ عَلَى غَنَمِهِ He says, one day Allah will make this affair, this religion uh, preponderant over others, will be above others. And until people will walk from حَذْرَ مَوْتِ, from, from uh, صَنْعَاءِ, this is in the south of the Hijaz, in Yemen, from that city to that city, and they will fear nothing. There will be no pirates. There will be peace. They will only fear Allah above them and the wild animals for his sheep. That's all. This was the prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at the end of, the, of this he says, Walakin, uh, what's the word? Tasta'ajilun. Jazakallah khair. Walakin tasta'ajilun. You're in a, in a haste. You're in a hurry. Relax. Sit down and be spectators of what Allah is going to let happen. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions went through this and he was preparing them to be strong. And in the middle of this Allah revealed Alif Lam Mim.
ما شاء الله ما شاء الله صدق الله هذا بس نار ود الله سيس جيبي فهم الله يرضى عليك السلام عليكم زهرة هات زهرة بعي I have to put on my glasses I can see خمسة أنا سيس ليال I know I know ليال so Allah revealed ألف لا ميم أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يبتنون ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فلعلمن الله الذين صدقوا وليعلمن الكاذبون كاذبين الله in the Quran says ألف لا ميم he revealed to the companions to make them feel at peace do people imagine that they will be left alone because they say we believe and they're not going to be tested Allah says we will ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم we have tried those before them already to, to see which of them will be truthful and which of them are lying. Does Allah need to know? Allah does not need. He's saying this in a sense that so that you will be given a chance to prove that you are truthful and others will not be able to because they're liars. Allahu <laughs> Alam. It's in the book. It's in the Quran. Al-Flamib is in the Qur'an. It's one of those letters that we don't understand the true meaning for them. Like Hameen, like Yaseen, like Faha. So as this was going on, we think that it is the Mustad'afeen who went through this hardship. But imagine who, who else? Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Sayyidina Abu Bakr was so, was so bullied radiyallahu anhu, he decided to leave. He was going out of the city. He was going toward Al-Habasha. Radiyallahu anhu wa ardah. The one whom the Prophet loved. The one whom is buried behind, beside the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one who saved, who freed all of the slaves. Under whose names, under whose hand, so many had become Muslims. So Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu, put his water a dragon on his back and he left the city of Mecca and as he was leaving someone by the name of Ibn Dughna or Ibn Dughna from the tribe of Al Qarra it's a great tribe a great uh, noble tribe he's the head of the tribe and he sees Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr is not nobody Abu Bakr is a great person he's also a great a tribe a nobleman so he sees Abu Bakr leaving the town and says Ila Ain where are you going Ya Abu Bakr Ila Ain he tells him Asihu fil ard wa li'abuda rabbi he says akhrajani qawmi fa uridu an asiha fil ardi wa a'abuda rabbi my people have forsaken me have chased chased me out so I want to walk and uh, on this land until I find a place where I can worship Allah. He says, مِثْلُكَ يَا أَبَا بَكْرِ لَا يُخْرَجْ You are noble. Uh, you, 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 you leave today, tomorrow I will leave. No, people like us, like you, will not leave. Stay. I will be your jar. فَأَنَا لَكَ جَارٌ Let's go. They walked in and they made a procession in the Kaaba. They did the tawaf and Ibn uh, Al-Dughna spoke to the Ashraf and he told him he's under my protection he's how could you how could you chase him you know who is Abu Bakr you know who Abu Bakr is لا يخرج مثله أتخرجون رجلا يكسب المعدوم ويصل الرحم ويحمل الكل ويقر الضيف and he kept he kept speaking about him beautifully he says are you going to chase someone and you know who he is he's a nobleman he helps the destitute. He is uh, generous to his guests. He speaks up for the truth. He says no. And they told him, fine. They said, you want to keep him under your protection? Mur Aba Bakrin Rabbahu fi darihi. If you want him to stay here, we will accept that. But he has to do his ibadah inside of his home. 
So he goes and he does ibadah inside of his home. And before too long, he wanted to go out and, and smell the breath, the fresh air. And uh, he built a little mosque outside of his house. And this fana could be just a small wall. Everyone could see him. And everyone became very admiring of him. The way that he was reading, the, the recitation of Quran. He would weep, he would break down crying when he reads the Quran. And the, and, and the, the, the Ashraf of Quraysh started to fear for their wives and their children. So they went back to, they sent someone to uh, Ibn Dughna and they brought him and they said, hey, didn't we tell you that he should not do this in public? If you want him, to st if you want to be his protector, you have to tell him that he has to stay in his house. Otherwise, he is not under your protection. So he went to, to Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and explained to him. And he told him, فَإِنِّي أَرُدُّ عَلَيْكَ جِوَارَكَ I don't want your protection. وَأَرْضَ بِجِوَارِ اللَّهِ so This is like a total... Uh, everything that, that goes on through in their life is like a purification. That their reliance is only on Allah. Uh, protector, whatever, nothing. I don't want anything. I want Allah. It's like Sayyidina Musa السلام, when he was in the fire and Sayyidina... Uh, was it Musa? Or Sayyidina Ibrahim? Ibrahim? Okay, alayhi salam. And uh, the angels came to him and said, I will do whatever you want. It's not, uh, we, I only want Allah. I'm only going to Allah. So this uh, powerful and very pure form of Tawheed was uh, what Allah was preparing them to, to, to become. It's at this time that the story of uh, Abu walid happened. And we spoke about this last week, so we want to repeat it again. That's when they, they, they sent Abu walid which is Utbah, Ibn Rabi'ah, one of the nobles and also one of the mustahzi'een. And at the end of the talk, you know, he was telling him, listen, all of this that you're telling us, this revelation, uh, I think it's just uh, a jinn coming and, and playing tricks on you. We will uh, hire the best doctors and so on. He says, Abel, what did you done? And then he recited to him, Hamim, this verse, this, these verses from the Quran, until he put his hand on his mouth. Stop. <laughs> this is too much, I can't hear this So he left And that's what we, we said last time You came with a face different from the face that we've sent you So Abel Walid now Was totally shaken But uh, he told him Do whatever you want <laughs> They call, yeah, call him whatever uh, All those things So during those days Again exactly when We will have to check um, the history, the, 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 the seerah During those days Something, maybe he was getting ahead He thought, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That he was getting ahead So he was sitting with The ashraf of Quraysh The mushrikeen And he was talking to them And they were listening And all of a sudden, who comes? Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum And he kept telling him Ya Rasulullah Imagine, this is an, uh, a blind man And one of the first to become a Muslim And he's standing right here And all the Ashraf Ya Rasulullah And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And we have to be very careful here <laughs> Very careful We have to go back to the Tafsir We have to go back to our scholars And make sure that we don't say the wrong thing Allah says Abasa wa tawalla Yes Yes, but it's between him and Allah. We have to have the respect of the Prophet ﷺ and learn more about this. Some scholars have said, well, Ibn, Abbas, uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum should have been respectful. But Allah wanted to teach something to the Prophet ﷺ and he revealed, Abasa wa tawalla and ja'ahu al-a'ma. Who memorizes this? Yeah? With your voice. Abasa wa tawalla and jaahu al a'ma, ma yudrika la la huya zeka, how yet the kerufat and fahu zikra. Oh, yes, but a mamma is tavna, fa and talahuta sada, from a lake and lay a zeka, or a mamma and jaaka yasa, or a yaksha, fa and talahu talaha. 
read, you read it, you read it. No, from the beginning. عَبَسَ وَتَوَلَّا أَنْجَاءَهُ الْأَعْمَى وأما من جاء كيسعى وهو يخشى فأنت عنه تلهى This is where it was revealed. This is how much was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the amazing thing is, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had such adab that, what, that when Sayyidina Ibn Umm Maktoum came, he would tell him, Marhaban biman atabani fihi rabbi. Welcome, the one for whom Allah has scolded me. You're so special that Allah has revealed a verse because of you. I love you. Welcome. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so uh, beloved of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also on those days, uh, when, when, when was in Shikaq al-Qamar? When did that happen? This was how much was revealed in that time. The rest was revealed another time. When was in Shikaq al-Qamar? When was the moon split? Like what year? Which year? I think. Uh, is it after Amr Husn? Or before? I think it's before. Yeah, I think sixth. When is Husn? Husn seven. Is it? Seven year of Biata? Yeah. Okay, so that's a homework for all of us. When did the moon split? Some of the uh, Siyar said it's five years before the Hijrah, so it's the eighth year. Wallahu alam. What was happening here? They continued, that, like they said, uh, Everything that you can think of, they tried to challenge him and contest him. So they used to come to him, this young man came to him and he said, uh, Oh Muhammad, give us, a, give us a, a proof. If you are really the Prophet of God, give us a miracle. He says, what do you want? He says, in Shikaq al-Qamar, he said, Anta shukka lana al qamara that moon you see there? So where did the, the spilling of the moon happen? In Medina? Mecca. In Mecca. He said, you see that moon? I want you to split it. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa started to make dua. Ya Allah, give me Nasr. <laughs> this is an amazing thing. Split that moon. So Allah inspired him. This is again. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He raised his hand like this, his finger, in one of the ahadith. And the moon split. It went like this. And how long did it happen? Uh, the whole night. I don't know how long, but it was many hours. Mm. It was many hours. And everyone saw it. And the two pieces of the moon came back. And what did they say? Sahar. <laughs> <laughs> he said... Uh, I think they made sujood, but then they, they became kufar. In yaraw ayatan yu'aridu wa yaqulu Sihrun Mustamir. This is, he, he, he keeps playing tricks on us. And one of the uqala, one of the smart people of the town, said, Listen, if this was truly a magic, people outside would not have seen this. Let's go ask people outside. And these Qurayshis, they were not patient. They wouldn't wait until people would come. They, they went out. They went out of the city and they caught the caravans and they asked them, did something wrong happen over the past few days? And they said, yes, on that particular night, the moon split. The moon split and it remained split for many hours. So many had become Muslim and many had rejected. Uh, who knows Usama who Zaghloun? Knows yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a scholar who speaks about the miracles of Quran and the science. He said that he was in, in, in the UK one time and a young man came to him. <coughs> His name was Dawood Musa Pitcock or something like that. So he, he, he sat with him. He says, you know, you know how I became Muslim? He was then the leader of the Islamic party. He says, I was teaching in university and a young student came to me and offered me a copy of the Quran. And the first, as soon as he opened the Quran, he read, اِقْتَلَبَتِ السَّاعَةُ وَانْشَقَّ الْقَمَرُ the hour has come and the moon has split. So the splitting of the moon is a sign of the last days. So that was the first thing and it was a challenge to him. How could this happen? And he said he was sincere. 
he did not, he was not like uh, being fictitious, what's that word? Huh? Anyway, <laughs> he said, many days passed, many weeks passed, and all of a sudden, I was looking at TV and there were three American scientists who were speaking about how much money was spent on travels to the moon. And, he, and uh, the, the animator was saying, how much was it? A hundred million, a hundred billion, a hundred billion dollars was spent on travels to the moon. And he says, that's terrible. You could have, we could have helped nations. And he says, but you know what happened? In our travels, one of the greatest one of the greatest uh, discoveries was that in the moon there is a belt that has a, a specific uh, there's something to it a crack from the surface to the to the heart of the moon and had we not traveled to the moon we would not have discovered it so these kufar have gone to the moon to prove that this has happened. This, we don't need anyone to prove it to us. It was narrated by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and it's in Bukhari, and it's also in Muslim. It's been narrated by Ibn Abbas, and it is mutawatir. If one companion says something, this is the adab of the companions. If I'm a companion and I say something, everyone agrees, no one repeats it. But they were all there, and they were all witnessing what I said, so it becomes mutawatir. It's not ahad. And after that, the Tabi'in, Atba'at Tabi'in, narrated it in thousands. And the Quran says, Talabat al wa Shaq al Qamar, it's mutawatir. To the point where even Mas'ud radiallahu anhu would walk in the street, he's baffled. He said, Laqad in Shaq al Qamar, Laqad in Shaq al Qamar, Laqad in Shaq al Qamar, wa yuraddidu, Laqad in Shaq al Qamar. This is so amazing, and it happened in those days, and this is only to show how they tried everything. The Prophet ﷺ was coming with proofs and they were pushing him back. So they tried something else. They said to him, okay, one year we worship your Lord and one year you worship our Lord. He says, subhanAllah, Allah revealed, قُلْ يَا يُهَا الْكَاثِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ so this kept going on until what happened in the fifth year, the first Hijra to Al Habasha. Huh? Did he go the first time? Uh, Jafar? Jafar. Uh, yes, I think. I don't think so. He was a spokesman. Second time. Oh, the second. Yeah. So the first time, some some scholars say eleven men and four women. Some say ten men and five women. And uh, Muhammad Qadari Bik, rahimahullah, he's passed away. Uh, he's that's the book that we're following. He says ten men and five women. Who are they? And look how specific he is. He doesn't say this companion and his wife. He would say the name of the companion and the name of the wife. So one of them, the first one is. Uh, Asratun Uthman ibn Affan. Who was he married with? Um Ruqayya. First Ruqayya. So these two. Radiallahu anhum. Abu Salama and Umm Salama. They didn't have a child then. His brother, the brother Abu Salama, and whose name is Abu Sebra or Sibra. And his wife, Um Kultum. Amir ibn Abiyya and his wife Layla. These are very, very important names. We, we have to remember, memorize them. Yeah. Amir ibn Rabi'ah and Layla. Abu Hudayfa ibn Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. This is the son of Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, this is Abu al Walid, which we mentioned earlier. Mm. The son of this great Mustahzi. And his wife, Sahlatun ibn Suhail. MashaAllah alayk. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. No. Also, Uthman ibn Mad'un whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved very, very dearly. Mus'ab ibn Umayr and uh, Suhail ibn al-Bayda was Zubair ibn al-Awam and uh, they were most from Quraysh. And what strikes me is that the, the author says 
ولم يبقى مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إلا القليل. So here's 11, uh, 15 people who have left, and Is about it from the book? it's from the book. Uh, nothing from here. This is just a fake. <laughs> so, what surprises me is that the same amount of people stayed behind. There weren't more, in, there, were, there weren't too many people. 30, 40, 50 companions by the fifth year. Subhanallah. Yet the Prophet ﷺ was very firm. He stood very firm. This is our aqidah. Layla. Who's Layla? Uh, the wife of, of uh, <coughs> Amr ibn Rabi'ah gives us a story she tells us now they all leave differently in different places we'll finish after this inshallah barakallah Rabi'ah tells us she, she's leaving now and she's alone no one is with her and who does she see? Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu this is like a very scary man He's tough. And he was tough about the Muslims. And she said, and she said, oh, what's going to happen? So he asked her, Ila Ain. He asks her, and she said, she said, Kana Umar shadidun alayna fi Islam. Fi Islamina. And she, he, he tells her, where are you going, La Ain, Ya Umar Abdullah? Faqultu, laqad adaytumuna fi deenina. You have heard us in our religion. So we're going. We're just leaving you. Uh, leave us alone. We're leaving you. And then he tells her, Sahibakum <laughs> Allah. What? This was not expected of Sayyidina Umar. Sayyidina Umar was a, a very, uh, he was very, uh, he, he, he was an enemy. Sayyidina Umar was an enemy. He wasn't, wasn't a Muslim yet. Sayyidina Umar was not a Muslim yet and he was hurting the Muslims and he tells her, may Allah be with you. So she's uh, very surprised when, she, when her husband meets her and joins her, she tells him the story and he tells her, Turjina and Muslim, don't be crazy. Do you think he's going to become a Muslim? And he said the, the very famous words. He says, Wallahi la yuslimu hatta yuslimu himar al-khattab. <laughs> These are very, very famous words of her husband. He says, well, Allah, you will not become a Muslim. This is Umar. Until his, his, uh, his mule becomes a Muslim. But the mule, her, his horse, his donkey. You know, his donkey will become... Not yet now. Uh, yeah, yeah, his himar is already Muslim. <laughs> so he tells him, so, so uh, it doesn't matter. Because the Prophet وسلم, had made a strong dua and he said, Allahumma a'izz al Islam bi Umar. May Allah make this religion aziz, very victorious and strong with Umar. Allah, and the Prophet وسلم, knew the personality of this man and his uh, status in the society. And then um, Sayyidina Ibn Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to say, Ma zilna a'izzatun aw a'izzatan. Since he became a Muslim, we became very, very proud and strong and honored. Uh, and he asked the Prophet وسلم, to go and, uh, and, and pray together in the, in the Kaaba. And so the Prophet وسلم, answered, this is not in public. So Umar became uh, a Muslim in Dar al Arqam, the Arqam, which was in secret. And I said, no, this is no more secret. Let's go out to the Kaaba and pray. And this caused a lot of trouble to the Quraysh. It devastated them. Umar becomes a Muslim? This is terrible. This is our end. So they decided to kill him. Decided to go and kill Umar. So they go to his house. And as they walk to his house, someone shows up. Al-As ibn Wa'il al-Sahmi. Remember? Al-As ibn Wa'il al-Sahmi. He's the father of Amr al-As. Yes. He comes in and he says, he knocks at the door of Umar and he tells him, what's, what's wrong? What's happening? He says, uh, they, they, it looks like they want to kill me. He says, لا سبيل إليك فأنا لك جار They will not come to you. I am your protector. So he was uh, 
in, in full protection and he went out and he met those Quraysh trying to come and kill Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, anhu and they told him Aina turidun? Where are you going? And he tells them Nuridu hada kill Abu Umar ibn Khattab He says La sabila ilayhi He stood so powerfully He says no way that you are going to step towards him فَرَجَعَ النَّاسُ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَتَوْ And Allah protected them وَأَقُولُ عَلَى قَوْلِ اسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ لِلَكُمْ وَصَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمَ عَلَى سَيْدِ مُحَمَّدِ اللهم احفظ أبناءنا ونساءنا وبناتنا وأباءنا والمسلمين جميعا اللهم حقق حقق أمنيتهم يا رحم الراحم اللهم نجحهم اللهم اجعلهم إمة الإسلام اللهم اجعلنا المتقين إماما اللهم ارحمنا ارحمهم ارحم المسلمين ووالدينا اللهم اغفر المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات أحياء منهم الأموات وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد الله يبارك فيك